Hey guys, Pastor Ivor Myers here, and I just want to encourage you to check out this message on the faith of Jesus and what it means and how it can revolutionize your understanding of what Christ desires from you. So check it out. Be blessed. We are going to be looking at this theme, go, we'll go back to the screen, the faith of Jesus, the faith of Jesus. What exactly is the faith of Jesus? Now, this term uh, we, we recognize most from the book of Revelation, uh, Revelation chapter 14 to be exact, verse 12, where the Bible says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now, what I want you to understand is that this, uh, this verse describing the saints at the end of time who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus, this verse is an end time context verse. And it's describing the remnant, those who will be delivered, those who will be saved by two characteristics. They keep the commandments of God and they have the faith of Jesus. Now, elsewhere in the book of Revelation, the same group of people are described, but I want you to note how it is described here. Revelation chapter 12, Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. Here's what the Bible says. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. All right. So what I want you to note here is that in one verse, it is the faith of God. Uh, and in the other verse, it is the testimony of Jesus. So Revelation 14, 12, here they, uh, here's the patience of the saints. Here they, they keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. But in Revelation 12, 17, the same group of people are described as keeping the commandments of God and having the testimony of Jesus. So what I want you to understand right off the bat is this. Let's go to the screen. The faith of Jesus equals the testimony of Jesus. Let me say that again. The faith of Jesus equals the testimony of Jesus. They are, in fact, one and the same thing. Whatever the faith of Jesus is, it is described as the testimony of Jesus in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. So again, the very first thing I need you to understand is that the faith of Jesus and the testimony of Jesus are one and the same. Okay, so our next question is very simple then. What is faith? What is faith? Let's go back to the screen. And we're going to look at the story of the centurion. Actually, we're going, to look at, we're going to be looking at several stories, but we're first going to start out with the faith of the centurion. Notice with me Matthew chapter 8, beginning with verse 5. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. I am going to do something. I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, 
he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And the servant was healed in the self same hour. The very next thing I need you to understand, and if you're following so far, just put a one in the chat. You know that the faith of Jesus is the same as the testimony of Jesus. And now we're looking at what is faith. And the first thing I want you to note about faith is this. Faith is full, the full unreserved confidence in the power of the word of God to do what it says it will do. Did y'all catch that definition? Faith is unreserved confidence in the power of the word of God to do what it says it will do. And this is why the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 11 and 12, it says, And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end that you be not slothful but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises what we see here is that faith is confidence in the word of God to do what it says it will do faith is that which grabs hold of the promises of God the words of God if you're with me so far just put a one in the chat you're following so far faith is an is a confidence in the promises in the word of God all right let's go to our next slide we're gonna to go to the book of Matthew chapter 8 verse 24 Matthew chapter 8 verse 24 the Bible says and behold there arose a great tempest in the sea insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves but he was asleep, that is Jesus. And his disciples came to him and awoke him saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he said unto them, why are you fearful, O ye of what? Little faith. Then he arose and rebuked the sea and there was a great calm. So the next thing I want you to understand about faith is that faith neutralizes fear. Jesus says, Oh, why were you fearful, O ye of little faith? So fear and faith are opposites. Faith is confidence which neutralizes fear. All right, let's keep moving. Let's keep moving. So we see that faith inherits the promises of God. Faith Trust is, is an unwavering confidence in the word of God. Faith neutralizes fear. Let's go again to the book of uh, Matthew chapter 14, verse 24. The Bible says here, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, be of good cheer. It is I, be not afraid. Then Peter answered and said unto him, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O ye of little faith, wherefore did you what? Doubt. The next thing I want you to understand about fear is that fee, about faith is that faith neutralizes doubt. Faith neutralizes doubt. So faith lays hold on the promises of God. Faith is unwavering confidence in the promises of God. Faith neutralizes fear. Faith neutralizes doubt. Let's keep moving. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 17. And verse 15, beginning with verse 15, 
uh, the Bible says, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed. For oft times he, fail, he falleth in the fire, and oft times in the water, and I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could we not cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall be removed, and nothing shall be impossible for you. So, what is the next thing I want you to understand, beloved? Y'all probably got this now. Faith neutralizes what? Unbelief. Faith neutralizes unbelief. So then, to recap, faith equals no fear, no doubt, and no unbelief. It grabs hold in an unwavering way of the promises of God. Are you with me so far? How many of you think faith is a powerful thing? Now, here's what I want y'all to catch, beloved. <laughs> it is the faith of Jesus that the Bible is pointing out. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Ivor. The faith of Iris. No, 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 no. The faith of Annette. No, 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 no. Mm -mm. The faith of Diamond. How about that? Oh, the faith of Candy. No, 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 beloved. It's the faith of Jesus. And there is a reason why. Because let me assure you that your faith, just like your repentance, is not worth much. Did y'all catch what I just said? Your faith, just like your repentance, is not worth much. Last week we learned that Repentance is a gift of God. Therefore, we have to ask God for repentance. We can't muster up our own repentance in the same way what we call our faith is not really supposed to be our faith. It's ours because Jesus has given it to us. We need his faith. Are y'all with me so far? Not the faith of anybody else, but the faith of Jesus. In fact, if you notice with me in Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, his very name is faithful. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he, do, he doth judge and make war. Jesus' very name is faithful. You can call him Jesus. You can call him the Messiah. You can also call him faithful. Now that's deep, you guys. He is faithful. His name is faithful because he is faithful. He is the very definition of faithful. So the Bible says, check this out, Luke chapter 16, verse 10, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in that which is least is unjust also in much. God is calling us, listen to me, you guys. God is calling us to be faithful. Now let me ask you a question, and I wanna see your comments in the chat. So this is a chat moment, okay? What does it mean to be faithful? What does it mean to be faithful? When God calls you to be faithful, what do you think of when you think, you know, I've got to be faithful? Let's see it in the chat. I, I just want to see just a few comments. 
Because I think I know what, what, what y'all are going to say. Loyal. Just. A believer. To be like Jesus. To keep your promises. Loyalty. Um, loyalty. Let me add obedient. Obedient. Okay. Now, while that is a definition of faithful, may I suggest to you that what God is actually asking us when he's saying, I want you to be faithful, may I suggest to you that what God is asking is for us to be faithful. Faithful. F-U-L-L. -L. Faithful. Full or full of faith. What do y'all think about that? To be faithful is to be full of faith. Why? Because my faith doesn't work. Right? My faith doesn't work. My faith is going to lead to emptiness. My faith can't fill me up, but Jesus' faith can fill me up. So God wants us to be full of faith, the faith of Jesus. Not the faith of myself, not the faith of my neighbor, the, the faith of Jesus. To be faithful means to be full of the faith of Jesus, which means that in essence, I will be full of confidence in the word of God. I will be full of that which leads me to not fear, to not doubt, and to not entertain unbelief. Are y'all with me so far? You see, beloved, Jesus' faith is the only faith that can penetrate the dark clouds of unbelief and fear and doubt. So I'm going to ask a question. How many of you have ever struggled with fear, unbelief, doubt, overwhelming fear, overwhelming unbelief, overwhelming doubt? What I need you to understand, beloved, is that Jesus has, has manufactured a faith that can pierce. It is the only faith that can pierce the clouds of darkness and fear and doubt and unbelief. And that's why, that's why he desires so bad for us to have his faith. It is a faith that allows us to see God when clouds are between us and him. Faith brings us faith to face with God. Can I say that again? May I say that again? Faith brings us faith to face with God. It is, the, it is the eye of faith that allows us to see beyond the dark clouds, allows us to see beyond the darkness, beyond the shadows, beyond the clouds. And, and Jesus says, I have manufactured a faith in my experience that if you take that faith, you're going to be all right. I need you to understand that if I, if I can give you this example, if I can give you this example, if, if, if we are all on the journey to God, which we're hoping we're all on the journey to God, if we're all on the journey to, to, to heaven, then I want you to imagine that the car that takes us there, the vehicle that is taking us there runs off of faith. So like you're getting ready for a journey, you got to go put gas in your car to get to that journey. Your car, your tank needs to be full of gas, especially if you're going a long distance. Well, heaven is a pretty far distance from us and the gas that is going to enable us to get there is faith. So, so, beloved, what I'm saying to you is that in order to get there, we need to have enough oil in the vessel or enough gas in the tank. And if I'm putting in my own gas, are y'all following me? If I'm putting in my own gas, 
I'm not going to have enough fuel, faith, to make it to heaven. So Jesus says, I will give you my faith. It's premium faith. It's premium, premium gas. It's premium oil. I will give you premium fuel to get you to heaven. Yes, Nicole, the just shall live by faith. Let me show you what Jesus manufactured for us. Let's go back to the screen. Matthew 26. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Bible says in verse, in verse 39 or verse 36. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane and saith unto his disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then he saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here with me and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto his disciples and findeth them asleep and saith unto them, Peter, what could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time and prayed, Oh, my father, if it be possible that this cup pass not from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. See, Jesus here in the garden of Gethsemane is praying a prayer that is unlike any other prayer that has ever been prayed. You see, Jesus is going through his own time of trouble, if you will. And, 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 and his experience is so deep and so dark that, that, that it is hard to put into words. In fact, uh, I thought I would just pull from the book, The Desire of Ages, just to show you what Jesus was going through as he prayed that prayer. And as he goes to the cross, listen to this. We're going to go back to the screen. Listen to what it says here. Desire of Ages. Amid the darkness, apparently forsaken of God, Christ had drained the last dregs in the cup of human woe. In those dreadful hours, he had relied upon the evidence the evidence of his father's acceptance heretofore given him. Please, just come back with me for a second. Just pause for a second. You guys help me out. What is the definition of faith? Faith is the what? Evidence of things not currently seen. So what we're reading here in the Desire of Ages is that Jesus had to depend on evidence. Why? Because it looked to him that his father had forsaken him. I'm going to ask y'all, you can if you want to. You don't have to if you don't want to. Put a one in the chat if you've ever felt that God's spirit left you. If you've ever felt that God had forsaken you. If you've ever felt, where is God when I need him the most? Put that one in the chat if you have ever felt that. And what I want you to understand here, beloved, is that Jesus went through the very same thing. And he had to rely on the evidence of past experience. Wow. Wow, come back. Let's, let's finish reading this. Watch this. Watch this, y'all. Watch the next sentence. Hope, listen, Satan with his fierce temptations wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave, a conqueror, or tell him of his father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. It was the sense of sin bringing the father's wrath upon him as man's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the son of God. All right, come back, y'all. Jesus was in a place in his experience where he could not even see. 
himself coming out of the grave, coming up in resurrection to his father. In other words, Jesus experienced what the sinner who is lost will experience when he realizes that salvation is closed. Watch this. There is no deeper darkness than that. None. It doesn't exist. But, but, let's go back to the screen, and I'm going to read that second statement again. Let's go back to the screen and watch this. The uh, uh, Desire of Ages says, He understood his mercy, his justice, and his great love. By faith. He rested in him whom it had ever been his joy to obey. And as in submission, he committed himself to God. The sense of the loss of his father's favor was withdrawn by faith. Christ was the victor. It was Christ's faith that pierced the darkness and the, and the anguish of the, the mental anguish of the second death. Now, my faith is not doing that. Your faith is not doing that. Your faith isn't strong enough. Your faith isn't good enough. My faith isn't strong enough. Nobody's faith is strong enough to do what Jesus' faith did when it pierced the mental anguish of the second death and said, regardless, I'm trusting in my Father. That, beloved, is the faith of Jesus. That is why we need his faith, not our own. Because his faith pierces darkness. His faith pierces depression. His faith pierces discouragement. His faith pierces everything the devil will try to bring before you to separate you from the love of your heavenly father. Now, now, I don't know if y'all are ready for this. But I have to read it. Note with me Matthew 20 verse 22. Matthew 20 verse 22. The Bible says here, Jesus answered and said, you know not what you ask. Remember when, when the mother brought the two disciples, uh, let my son sit on your right hand and your left hand when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered and said, you know not what you, what you ask. Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they say unto him, we are able. And he said unto them, listen, you shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. Now, how many of y'all just got nervous? How many of y'all just got nervous just now? When you read those words, you indeed will be baptized with my baptism and drink of the cup that I drank of. Did anyone get nervous just now? Beloved, listen to me. What Jesus is saying is that the devil will come to you in the same way he came to me. He will come to you and say, listen, you're lost. You're no good. You're not accepted by God. You are not going to be saved. The afterlife, you can forget about it. And Jesus says, you're going to have to be baptized with that baptism. You're going to have to be able to stand in the face of that of, of that doubt, in the face of that fear, your faith is going to need to pierce that very feeling. But he says, there's good news. I will give you the faith. <laughs> you know, it's like the devil says, look, at, check out my weapon. Check out this weapon of darkness. Check out this weapon of deep discouragement. Check out this weapon. You, you can't penetrate this. And Jesus says, come here, my son. Come here, my daughter. I'm going to give you my faith. My faith can pierce, can pierce that weapon. Are you following me? Jesus tells us, beloved, Jesus tells us that because of his victory, we may be victors. Faith is the victory. Yeah, it's true. Faith is 
the victory that overcomes the world. Check this out, y'all. Come back with me to Luke 22. Luke 22, verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee, both into prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. I need you to understand this. When Peter was about to come face to face with death, all of a sudden, that faith, <laughs> which was his faith, <laughs> he had faith in himself. Yeah, man, Jesus, I got you. And Jesus was like, man, you don't even realize that when, when you come face to face with death, your faith is going to disappear out the window. Your faith is going to disappear out the window. All right, Lord, keep this thing, please. <laughs> your faith is going to disappear, Peter. So, so Peter, I'm praying that your faith fail not. In other words, I'm praying that you're actually going to understand what it means to grab hold of me, to grab hold of my faith, to grab hold of my righteousness. You understand, beloved, that at the end of time, God's people are going to face trials and tribulations like the world has not seen, a time of trouble such as never was. And unless we have a faith that can penetrate not only the grave, but also the thought of the second death. There's going to be a lot of folding. There's going to be a lot of bowing out. So, so beloved, this is why God says, I want your faith tank. We're driving our car to heaven. The car to heaven has a faith tank. I need your faith tank to be full. I need your faith tank to be full. I need you to be faithful, not faithless. Faithful, not faithless. Now, I'm going to tell you something, beloved, because I want you to understand this. And, and this is something that you may have never considered before. So, so sit up and listen up, y'all. According to Romans chapter 14, verse 23, the Bible says, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. All right? Check this out, you guys. Here's what I need you to understand. Faith and sin are opposites. Faith and sin are opposites. And, and, and the reason, listen to me, the reason why God hates sin is because sin weakens faith. I think there's a moment that I just need to step back for a moment and just let y'all grasp what was just said. The reason that God hates sin, the reason that God hates when we sin is because sin weakens faith. Sin weakens our ability to trust God despite our, our sinfulness, despite uh, the fact that we don't deserve it. Sin leads us, it turns faithfulness into faithlessness. It put holes, it puts holes in the faith tank. So now you can begin to understand, for example, go, know with me Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God in the garden, walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife, what did they do? They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, where art thou? Please understand this. Sin led Adam and Eve to run from God. Sin led them to doubt the goodness 
of God. Sin led them to doubt the love of God of God. And this is why, this is why God doesn't want us to sin because sin is ultimately going to affect our relationship with God in terms of us trusting the word of God, trusting that God loves us, trusting that he desires to save us, trusting that he can in fact save us. That's what sin does. Sin makes it impossible, makes it difficult, I should say, makes it difficult to take hold of the promises. Are, are y'all catching the, important, the importance of what I'm saying right now? This is why God hates sin. The reason God hates sin is because it creates a deceptive picture of God as someone who is to be afraid of and who is eager to destroy and kill. Sin destroys faithfulness, which is the avenue whereby one becomes a friend of God. Sin leads you to think that God is not your friend. Sin leads you to think that God is out to destroy you. So the reason, beloved, we should hate sin is because it messes, it empties the faith tank. Please put a one in the chat if you're following, if you're understanding what I'm saying. Jesus invites us to fill up on faith, his faith. Because our faith is not going to make it. It's not going to bring us through. It must be his faith. But sin lessens our ability to grab hold of the faith of God. Now watch this. Come back with me to the screen. And I want you to see this, beloved. Because note how the Bible puts it. Galatians chapter 2, 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Translated. The faith of Christ, I've received it, that will now help me grab hold of the promise that I am saved, not by the works of the law, but by the mercy of God. I gotta have faith to believe that despite all my past wickednesses, despite my unworthiness, if I have the faith of Jesus, which is unwavering confidence without fear, doubt, or unbelief, if I truly hold on to this promise that God loved me so much that he wants to see me in the kingdom of heaven, that is what the faith of Jesus does for us. Romans 3. Romans 3, 21, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ upon all them and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Jesus, I need y'all to understand this. Galatians 3.22, but the scripture has concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. All right, so, so far what we've learned, so far what we've learned is that it is the faith of Jesus, not the faith of anybody else, but the faith of Jesus that I need. Most importantly in my life, Jesus, I am praying that you give me your faith so that I can grab hold of the promise and not doubt, not fear, not be discouraged, but grab hold of that promise with an unwavering faith that you will justify me because of your mercy. Because I believe you, because I, I accept you into my heart and into my life. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Pastor, what about the law of God? And I thought, let me let someone else say it. Let me let someone else say it. Because this person probably say it better than me. So I want you to check this out. Let's go back to the screen. Let's go back to the screen. The thought, Gospel Workers, page 103. The thought that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us 
not because of any merit on our part, but as a free gift from God is a precious thought. The enemy of God and man is not willing that this truth should be clearly presented, for he knows that that, watch this, you all, doubt, unbelief, and darkness shall compose the experience of those who claim to be the children of God, he can overcome them with temptation. The simple, that simple faith that takes God at his word should be encouraged. Listen, God's people must have the fa that faith which will lay hold of divine power, for by grace are you saved through faith and not that of yourselves, it is the gift of God. She goes on to say, those who believe that God for Christ's sake has forgiven their sins should not through temptation fall, fail to press on to fight the good fight of faith. Their faith should grow stronger until their Christian life as well as their word shall declare the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Now I want you to watch, watch, watch what she says next here. Are you already Watch this. The third Angel's message is the proclamation of the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. The commandments of God have been proclaimed, but the faith of Jesus Christ has not been proclaimed by Seventh-day Adventists as of equal importance. The law and the gospel going hand in hand. I cannot find language to express this subject in its fullness. The faith of Jesus is talked of, but not understood. What constitutes the faith of Jesus that belongs to the third angel's message? Jesus becoming our sin bearer that he might become our sin pardoning savior. He was treated as we deserve to be treated. He came to our world and took our sins that we might take his righteousness, faith in the ability of Christ to save us amply and fully and entirely is the faith of Jesus. All right. All right. Did y'all catch that? You mean the third angel's message that, that we are called to believe, to, to, we are called to preach, is not just about the commandments of God and the commandments of God and the commandments of God and, and people are breaking the law of God, which everybody, the whole world is guilty for breaking the law of God, even when you decide to become a, 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 a commandment-keeping person, that you still are guilty of breaking the law of God. So in deciding to keep the commandments from now on does not justify you because you're already, you have already broken the law. Do you realize? Realize that the third angel's message, beloved, is not just about presenting the condemning picture of the law. Y'all are all guilty. Why? Because you've all broken the law of God. That's what we do. You're guilty. Now keep the law. You're guilty. Now keep the law. You're guilty. Now keep the law. Beloved, listen to me. Yeah, we say you're guilty. Accept Jesus as your sacrifice and you'll be good. We get that. But listen, how many? You see, we talk of the faith of Jesus. Peter, I got it. I am with you, Lord. I got you. But how many of God, how many of us will end up like Peter in that time of crisis, not realizing that we talked about the faith of Jesus, but didn't actually have the faith of Jesus? Come on, y'all. Come on, are y'all, put a one in the chat if you're following what I'm saying so far. Put a one in the chat if this makes sense so far. Because we're, we're about to shift gears because, let's just do it. Let's just do it. Let's, let, let's go to Revelation chapter 19, verse 10. Now remember, early we had said that the faith of Jesus is the same thing as the testimony of Jesus. Right? Faith of Jesus equals testimony of Jesus. So now the question is, well, what is the testimony of Jesus? Let's go back to the screen. Notice with me Revelation 19 verse 10. The Bible says here, and I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, see thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Okay. Okay, huh, 
Well, what does that mean, Pastor? How is the testimony of Jesus the spirit of prophecy? Well, notice with me, John chapter 5, verse 39. The Bible says here, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which, what? Testify of me. So the Bible is a testimony of Jesus Christ. Are you with me? But watch this. It is not only, the scriptures are not only the testimony of Jesus, but they are also the testimony of Jesus. <laughs> Let me say that again. The scriptures are not only the testimony of Jesus, but they are also Jesus' testimony. Please put a one in the chat if you follow what I just said. The Bible is not just the testimony about Jesus, but it is also Jesus' testimony. It is Jesus' words. Listen. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 9, verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Where unto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So in other words, beloved, the more sure word of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. So here's what that means. Jesus says, all right, I'm about to testify. What are you about to testify, Jesus? I'm going to testify that for 1260 years, a little horn power is going to do X, Y, and Z. Well, okay, Jesus, let's see if your testimony becomes true. Well, Lo and behold, Jesus gives that testimony to Daniel. And what? Thousands of years later, we see, whoa, Jesus' testimony was true. Please, please put a one in the chat if you follow what I'm saying right now. The testimony of Jesus is, is the words Jesus speaks, particularly about what is coming or what will happen. That's why it's called the spirit of prophecy. Jesus says, my testimony is unlike anybody else's testimony. By the way, by the way, how does faith come? Can anyone tell me how faith comes? How does faith come? Let's go to the screen. How does faith come? Y'all know the answer to this, right? Faith, faith, watch this, y'all. Faith comes by faith. Hearing and hearing by the word of God. So in other words, what the Bible is telling me here is that the more I hear the word of God or the testimony of Jesus, my faith should be being built up. If I want more faith, hear the word of God. Hear the more sure word of God. Hear the more sure word or testimony of Jesus. Hear the more sure word or testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy. Why? Because when I begin to look back in the past and see everything Jesus said would happen has happened just as he said it would. My confidence. What did I just say, y'all? My what? My confidence in the word gets stronger. Let's go back to the screen. Note again with me, uh, Hebrews 11 verse 1. Hebrews 11 verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Things not seen. Okay, so, so Hebrews, Hebrews writer, what do you mean when you say faith is the evidence of things not seen? Okay, well, let's, let's, let's see if the same writer will tell us. Let's go to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 7. The Bible says here, watch this, by faith, Noah, being warned of God 
of things not seen as yet. Moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness, which is by what? Faith. Okay, come back, y'all. Oh, Lord, help me to break this down. How was Noah declared righteous? How was Noah declared righteous? By hearing what God said, a flood is coming. Even though you don't see it yet, Noah, it's coming. And I need you to believe my word. And because Noah, because Noah believed, because Noah believed, Watch this, y'all. Not because Noah was good. Not because Noah was right. Not Noah believed God. And God counted it to him as righteousness. Wait, what? You mean Noah became the heir of righteousness by faith simply because he believed God? and moved and acted upon that belief. He demonstrated that belief by building the ark. Ah. What was the thing not yet seen? It was prophecy. God gave Noah prophecy and Noah believed the prophecy. He believed the testimony of Jesus. And in believing the testimony of Jesus, he was declared righteous by faith. Watch what the Bible says. Notice with me Isaiah 45 verse 21. Tell ye and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. And who has declared this from ancient time? Who has told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? There is no God beside me a just God and a savior. There is none beside me. Look unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth for I am God and there is none else. It's as if God is saying in this verse, listen, who can tell you the future? Nobody has a testimony that can declare future things to come. That's what the text we just read said. So because my testimony is unlike any other, I'm telling you, you should believe in me. Believe in me because when I make a promise, listen to me all. When I make a promise, I am good on my promises. I am good on my promises. In fact, look at what Jesus said in the New Testament. Look at what he said in the New Testament. John chapter 13, verse 19. Now I tell you before it come to pass, that when it come to pass, you may believe that I'm here. Did y'all see that? Jesus said, I'm telling you something before it comes to pass. Testimony of Jesus. Spirit of prophecy. That when it come to pass, you may believe the faith of Jesus. Come on, y'all. Did y'all did see that just now? <laughs> did you see that? The testimony of Jesus and the faith of Jesus are one and the same. What happens is, as we as Christians today look back at the testimony of Jesus from Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and, and, and Joshua and Judges and Daniel and, and Revelation, and we see, man, everything he has said has come to pass so that when he says, believe me, that in the future, a stone is coming out of the sky. Believe me when I say that in the future, there's going to be a kingdom that is set up in which you and your family and your loved ones and your friends can live in forever and ever. I need you to believe. Believe me when I say that the way that you get there is not by your own works, but by faith in me. Now we can say, well, you know what? If 100% of what he said back there, the testimony of Jesus, is good, then really... What reason do I have to doubt his goodness? What reason do I have to doubt 
the promise that he says that he has given me when he says, I love you, my son. I love you, my daughter. The devil is going to come to you and tell you that you are unworthy, that God has forsaken you, that you are no good, that, that, that he will tell you everything possible for you to let go of the promise of God. And beloved, I need you to understand that this is why, this is why it is so crucial for us to have the testimony of Jesus. It is so crucial for us to believe the testimony of Jesus because in so doing, our faith is strengthened. Our faith is his faith. And we walk and we move in his faith. Notice with me, Hebrews 11, verse 13. And by the way, yeah, I'm going to hold that to the end. I just need y'all to catch something crucially important here. But with, just, just, just follow me. Just follow me. Hebrews 11, 13. These all, watch this. These all died in faith. These all died in faith, faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. In other words, beloved, and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed them, confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Listen, it is faith and it was faith that allowed them to see the promises afar off. The testimony of Jesus points us to what Jesus has said in the past. Everything has been accurately fulfilled. The faith of Jesus helps us. See, you don't need faith for the past. Oh yeah, that's that stuff. You can look at history and see it's come to pass. You need faith. Are y'all with me? It is the faith of Jesus that allows us to see the promises afar off and grab hold of those promises and confess and embrace them and confess we are strangers in this world. We are str we're, we're headed to a better land. That's right, Clint, standing on the promises. The eye of faith enables us to see, embrace, and be persuaded. So then check this out. The promises of the future are as good as the prophecies of the past. Let me say that again, y'all. The promises of the future are as good as the prophecies of the past. And so the devil will come in and try to get you to doubt those promises of God. But, but listen, listen, beloved, let me, let me clarify this. The promises of God are conditional. And they're conditional upon our belief. That's why he says, I want you to have the faith of Jesus so that you may believe. And if you're struggling with that belief, you know what to say. Lord, I believe. Help thou my what? Unbelief. Notice with me the book of Hebrews, chapter 6, verse 13. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself saying, surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Watch this. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of the promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into the, the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. If I can, let me break this down for you. You see, God comes to Abraham and he says to Abraham, Abraham, I am swearing that I'm going to do this for you. Now, there is no one higher than me to swear by. So I'm swearing by myself on my own word that my promise to you is good. That's what God is trying... I need you to have faith in me that my promise to you is good. Romans 
Romans 4, 1. Romans chapter 4, verse 1. And I want you to know what the Bible says here. What shall we say then? That Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, has found. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Did y'all catch that just now? Why was Abraham declared righteous? Put it in the chat for me, please. Why was Abraham declared righteous? He was declared righteous because he believed. Faith. Yes, yes, yes. Come on. We're going to keep reading. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. Wait, what? Justify the ungodly? Oh, uh, I would, that would, that, that includes me. Whew. What? Hold on, y'all. Come on, come on. Let's go back. But believeth on him that justified the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Verse 9, Cometh this blessing then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. For the, or verse 13, for the promise that he should be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Okay, uh, you may have missed that on the screen, but I need to highlight this word. If we can pull this up on the screen, I need y'all to highlight this. I need you to catch this. For the promise that he should be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Not righteousness by faith. The Bible uses that term. But this says the righteousness of faith, meaning <laughs> the righteousness was faith. Did, did y'all catch that just now? The righteousness itself was faith. The faith he had was the righteousness. The belief he had, that's what made him righteous. Not what he did, not what he didn't do. His belief in the word of God to do what it said it would do. So that, beloved, when the devil comes to you and says, you're no good, when the devil comes to you and says God's promises don't apply to you, beloved, we are to, by the faith of Jesus, rebuke the enemy. <laughs> yes, y'all. Yes, yes, yes. It is the faith of Jesus, beloved. It is the righteousness of faith. It is the righteousness of faith. If you are faithful, God says, I'm going to declare you righteous. And then your actions and, and, and your, your keeping the law of God is not because it's not because you're trying to gain heaven through keeping the law of God. You have already gained heaven because you believe what Jesus said. And when you believe what Jesus said, it is evidence. So when he says, hey, also, don't break my commandments, you're like, okay, I'm going to honor and respect your commandments, Lord. And if I happen to fall and break one of those commandments, I know that I have an advocate with the Father. I'm not going to continue just, yeah, the commandments, whatever. I'm already saved. No, no, no. That is the wrong spirit. That's not the spirit of Christ. 
So now we begin to see how the law and the spirit work together, how, how, how the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus work together. Therefore, watch this, verse 16, therefore it is of faith, Therefore, it is of faith that it might be grace, not to, uh, to, the, to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Listen, y'all. Listen, the Bible says that God calls the things that are not as though they were. That's prophecy, y'all. And God is saying, listen, I will redeem you. I will deliver you. Believe it by faith. Accept that God has accepted you by faith. Stop doubting his love for you. Stop doubting his mercy towards you. Believe that he has received you. Hmm. Check this out, y'all. Check this out. Why does he use Abraham in this example? Watch this. Why? Go back to the screen. The Bible says, who against hope believed in hope? that he might become the father of many nations. According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead. When he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him. Watch this. But for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, who was delivered for our offense and raised again for our justification. Wow, 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 wow. Listen, y'all. The Bible says Abraham was as good as dead. And yet God brought forth life out of something that was good as dead. Do you understand, beloved, that this is a picture of the resurrection? Do you understand that what God is saying here is, look, Abraham's life is for all, per it, his life looks like it's over. It's, it's done. He's as good as dead. But out of the dead came forth life. God says, I want you to believe just as Abraham clung to the promise of life coming out of death. I want you to understand that there is, the, there is a day coming that I will come out of the sky and I will pull you from the grave and you shall live. I need you to trust that. We're almost done, y'all. We're almost done. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. We're almost done. Yes, beloved, God is faithful. Notice with me, Romans 1, 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. This is why, this is why, beloved, especially for us as Seventh-day Adventists, we need to understand that this is in fact, notice with me Revelation 14, verse 6. Revelation 14, 6 tells us, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. What did we just see was the gospel, the everlasting gospel? I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Beloved, the, listen, y'all, the three angels' messages which call for the preaching of the everlasting gospel into the whole world is the message that the just shall live by faith. Justification by faith. The third angel's message in verity. 
All right. All right. I got a few more for you and then we're done, all right? I need you to follow this carefully. We're at the end of the sermon. <laughs> we are done. <laughs> Listen. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 14, the Bible says, For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence, our faith, steadfast unto the what? Unto the end. Now, let me ask you a question, y'all. What does the end mean here? What is the end? Put it in the chat for me, please. What is the end? When Paul here writes, if, you, if you're steadfast unto the end, what does that mean? What is the end? Okay, so, so I'm watching the comments. What is the end? And both are right. There is either being faithful unto death or being faithful unto the second coming. Now, if I can use an analogy uh, 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 to demonstrate this, I'm going to use the Red Sea and the Jordan. The Red Sea and the Jordan. Now, you remember the children of Israel had to cross two rivers on their journey, two bodies of water on their journey to the promised land. One was the Red Sea, and the other was the Jordan. Now, now the, the Red Sea, imagine this now. They are being chased by their enemies. And, and, and God says, go forward. Go forward where? Into the Red Sea. What? That's certain what? What is that, y'all? That would be certain death. That would be certain death. And yet God says, go forward. The, 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 the waters go up and they, they walk, as it were, almost like through. You know, when you think of Psalm 20, let, let's look at Psalm 23 real quick. I, I, let, let's, <coughs> let's notice this. Psalm 23. Exodus 14, 15 first. And the Lord said unto Moses, wherefore Christ thou unto me, speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. You remember that baptism is, is a symbol of death, right? Y'all know that, right? Baptism is a symbol of death. So I want to, if you can, just imagine that Red Sea, the crossing of the Red Sea, where they cross the Red Sea and then they end up standing on the other side. Watch this. Uh, um, remember Psalm 23, Psalm 23, uh, verse 1. Uh, the Bible says here, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It almost seems like the crossing of the Red Sea in a symbolic a uh, uh, poetic sense is much like this 23rd Psalm. If I may say it this way, many of us, many of God's people are going to have to cross the Red Sea in order to get into the promised land. Did y'all catch, catch what I'm saying here? They're going to have to, 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 to enter into that valley of the shadow of death. And God says, I need you to have a faith that will keep you even though you die. But then there's the Jordan. And you remember the difference with the Jordan is that when they were crossing the Jordan, they were crossing to go into a, a time of conflict. It's interesting, it's interesting how if you note with me in Deuteronomy chapter, uh, in fact, uh, Deuteronomy chapter, chapter, 
We'll go to Jeremiah chapter 12. Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 5, which says, If thou hast run with the footmen, and they have wearied thee, how then can thou contend with horses? And if in the land of peace, wherein thou trusted they weary thee, how shalt thou do in the swelling of the Jordan? I need you to understand that this swelling of the Jordan is a reference to a time of trouble such as never was. Check this out. Uh, according to... Daniel 12 verse 1, the Bible says, At that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. And now check out what Ellen White says about this end time event. Said the angel, If thou hast run with the footmen, and they have wearied thee, then how canst thou contend with horses? And if in the land of peace wherein thou trusted they wearied thee, then how wilt thou do in the swelling of the Jordan? The time of trouble is before us. And if there is lack of courage, faith, unwavering belief, If there is lack of courage and ambition now, let's keep reading, how will they pass the fearful scenes of that trying hour? In another place, she says this, soon after they had commenced their earnest cries, cry, the people of God, the angels in sympathy desired to go to their deliverance. But a tall commanding angel suffered them not to. He said, they must drink of the cup. They must be baptized with the baptism. Wow. Some of us are going to go through the Red Sea. Some of us are going to have to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Some of us are going to be alive for the Jordan, for the crossing of that Jordan, for that time of trouble. But beloved, either way, whichever one it is, faith is the thing that will prepare us to either cross the Red Sea or to cross the Jordan. We don't know which ones we're going to face, but beloved, we must have the faith that pierces death. We must have the faith that pierces the time of trouble. We must have the faith that enables us to overcome the world. And this is why Jesus says, this is why Revelation says, here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. And now for the good, that's already good news, but I just, look, look, I got three verses for you and then we're done. Check this out, y'all. Check this out. Matthew 24, verse 30. Listen to what the Bible says here. Matthew 24, verse 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with heaven and great glory. Watch this. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together the elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. All right, y'all. How many angels are in heaven? How many angels are in heaven? How many angels are in heaven? Somebody give me a number. It's innumerable. It's innumerable. Think about this, y'all. If Jesus empties heaven to go get his people, are y'all catching? <laughs> are if Jesus empties heaven to go get the people that are going to be in heaven. If one angel goes to get one person, <laughs> do y'all understand what I'm saying here? <laughs> 
There is a reason why the Bible says in Revelation 12, Revelation 7 verse 9, after this I beheld, and lo, watch this, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Listen, y'all. If God empties heaven and all the angels have assignment to go get at least one person, at least one person, all the angels, imagine those angels as they're riding on their horses and, and, and an angel comes down and swoops up, swoops up someone, throws them on the back of the horse. Come on, you. We're going to heaven. If it's an, an, an innumerable number of angels, beloved, then it would make sense that God is going to redeem an innumerable number of people. And then, and then in heaven, God's going to be like, Abraham. <laughs> Abraham. Come here. Remember when you died? How, how many, uh, remember that promise? Here, here. Genesis 22 said, this is the blessing, I will bless thee. In multiplying, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand of the sea, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemy, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you were good, because you didn't sin, because you were perfect. Oh, no, 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 sorry. Because you obeyed my told you look around try to count <laughs> beloved today today there are people struggling to believe that God loves them struggling to believe that Jesus has forgiven them I saw something interesting last week as I was preaching that sermon on Jacob. Uh, I think it was last week where I brought up Jacob. Yeah, it was. And, and in the story, you may not realize this, but when Jacob is going back to his home and the Bible says that he sees the angels of God and he calls the name of the place Mahanam, that was the evidence right there that God was with him. But he didn't believe he still sent forth people to try to talk to, to Esau. Hey, you know, <clears throat> he was still trying to prepare when God had already given him evidence that he was with him. Beloved, many of us are wrestling right now. Am I really right with God? Does God really love me? Has God forsaken me? How come I don't feel his presence? How come I don't feel his spirit? How come I don't feel, 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 feel? Ah, I need the faith of Jesus so that despite what I feel, despite the emotions I'm going through, despite the depression, despite the discouragement, despite all of these things that I may be feeling right now, I'm going to understand that faith and feeling are two different things. So while... <clears throat> The devil will play with my feelings. I'm going to stand firm on my faith. Because that faith is Jesus' faith. Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Jesus says, okay, I'm going to give you my faith. I will believe for you. I will be your faith. So... My appeal to you, beloved. This is the message that God, that we are told is to lighten the earth with its glory. It is the message of the goodness and mercy of God. It is a message that people need to hear. 
people are living under discouragement. They're living under condemnation. They're living under fear. And God is saying, I need you. I need you to help people understand that I am not who they think I am. But before you can do that, you must learn to grab hold of this faith for yourself. Beloved, can you imagine when the world hears, when the world hears the true balance between the law of God and his mercy and his justice? Yeah. I, I like that, Nicole. It is the size of a mustard seed. Genuine faith. See, you can have faith the size of a, of, a, of a world, but if it's not genuine faith, it's not going to do anything for you. If you have faith, the si genuine faith the size of a mustard seed, it is more powerful than any false faith out there. So, beloved, listen. God is calling you to trust him. He's calling you to trust him. And listen, especially as Seventh-day Adventists, we are so law That's what she was telling us. We've preached the law of God. We don't understand the faith of Jesus. Wow. Lord, teach me. Teach me. Grant me your faith. And then, let, and then let me take that message to my children, to my friends, to my neighbors. Help me, Lord, to live this message out. Help me to have faith so that whether I cross the Jordan or I cross the Red Sea, no matter which one, Lord, I will be ready to know that I will meet you and I will be able to live with you in the kingdom of heaven forever. If that's your desire, I'm going to ask you to put that seven in the chat because the number seven is the number of perfection. So, Lord, perfect my faith by giving me your faith. Please, Lord, help me. Help me to not be discouraged, to not be afraid, to not fear, to not to not dwell in the darkness, Lord, please teach me, teach me, teach me. Heavenly Father, I'm praying today that for every person who has struggled through their entire experience as a Christian, who have doubted your love, your mercy, who have looked at the circumstances they were in rather than look at your love and your goodness, teach Teach us, Lord, to have the faith of Jesus. Lord, I want to thank you for delivering this message because it is a message, I believe, that are going to save people from those harassing thoughts and troubling thoughts of not being connected with you, Lord. Please do something special that the light of your glory may, may lighten the earth, enlighten the earth with its glory. Because right now, Lord, the earth is in darkness. We need the good news. And so, Lord, we thank you for, 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 for speaking to us today, Lord. Grant us that faith is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. May God bless you. And may you take this message and internalize it by the grace of God.